the hero they bore him back home. Rowling has said that um, she's flattered if someone wants to write in her in her universe. I think there's there's a lot of motivations for why people do it, and for some people it, it's a way to start writing because some of the creative work has already been done for you by the the writer who created the fictional universe, and then you can sort of enter that universe and wiggle around in there and create some stuff of your own. Though it's true, he was the tide also sort of metaphorically refers to Hogwarts because Hogwarts becomes a magical center of education and scholarship and, and a school that, that endures for over a thousand years. It's in the magical universe. It's still there today. I live in Toronto, Canada, which is a, a big city, and you get it gives you lots of choices of things to do. I feel quite lucky. Um, the the crowds and the noise, you know, it's, it's it's a trade off, but it means I get to do things like belong to a blind sailing club or a blind tennis uh, organization or a goalball, and so there's lots of opportunities around. And I loved creating audio out of out of some of that fun stuff. Odo was made to the days he was born that time turner lay on her breast it really gave me a sense of why people take pictures because as a blind person I'm like yeah ho hum another picture and that's one of the, the the good parts for me about making audio that isn't just reading it's it's lots of sounds you've got this audio tapestry that's a real thing that that triggers memories in a way that I guess photographs do for for sighted people Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Today we're talking to Christine Malek. She's an author who just released her new book, Before the Tide. It's a fan fiction novel, and she'll explain what fanfic really is. She's also an accomplished musician, a writer, a blog writer, poet, and an audiophilist in her own right. First, we're going to talk about a new book that she just released, some of the processes that she goes through to create these universes and worlds that she'll describe to you. And then we're going to go into some of her audio, her creations, some of her passions. How are you doing, Christine? I'm doing great, thanks. So can you tell our listeners, what is fanfic? Fanfic is fiction written in the creative universe of another author. So uh, mine specifically is Harry Potter fan fiction, but there's there's whole rafts of fan fiction. So some people write in the universe of, of Lord of the Rings or Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You, you name it, there's, there's people writing fan fiction about it. And it's mostly an internet phenomenon for several reasons, one of which is that because because the ideas involved in the creative, some of the creative process is our copyright, you can't charge for it. And so people aren't, aren't really likely to be producing uh, hard copies, which would cost you to produce in, in, a, in a format where you're not going to be able to sell them. So it's, it's largely an internet phenomenon, people writing really great creative work based on the characters and setting of another author. Christine, I've noticed on social media that you will release sections, some teasers or chapters of the stuff that you are working on. Is that part of the fan fiction culture? Yes, a lot of it is published in serial form so that a lot of the fan fiction websites, this is what I was doing as I was writing Before the Tide, my fanfic novel, I was posting it chapter by chapter as as I was writing. And so as a reader, frankly, that would drive me crazy. I would I would not like to read uh, work in that way. But a lot of people seem to be quite tolerant of it. Um, and as a writer, it's it's brilliant. I loved it because as I was going, I was getting feedback um, about what I was writing and, and lots of encouragement. And often as a writer working on long stuff, long fiction, you just sort of got your head buried in a laptop and you're not getting much um, much feedback or encouragement at all. And so you're sort of laboring away in obscurity. So so to publish in a serial way is is very satisfying uh, or was for me. Um, and and I'm, I'm so grateful to people who are reading my stuff as I went because like I said, I don't, I don't have the patience. I want to sit down with a book and read it at my own pace. But a lot of fanfic is, is definitely uh, posted in serial form. So some of it's short stories which are self-contained, but then the longer works like novel length stuff often does come out in in serial form just occurred to me i never thought of reading a book as binge reading 
Oh, really? I do. <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> well, I think it's it's kind of funny because people talk about binge watching. That's sort of the new the new phrase, and it's almost phrased as though it's bad, like you're binging with you know excessive consumption of. But it's it's no one thinks it, thinks it's too strange if you sit down and read for four hours. Well, maybe some people do, but yeah, if you sit down with a book for four hours, that's just reading. But if you watch four hour long episodes of something, all of a sudden you're binge watching. So I don't know what that means, but I've I've, I've often been struck by the phrase binge watching uh, as opposed to just sitting down with a book. Christine, speaking of books, why don't you tell our listeners about your newly released fan fiction book, Before the Tide? So Before the Tide is a story of the four founders of Hogwarts, Hogwarts being the, the wizarding school. And Rowling gives us little tidbits about them in her books. And because my passion is historical fiction writing, my imagination was just always trying to peer around the borders and see what's what's behind the legends and and it so I built up a story which it takes place in 1066 in England and the four founders come from I, I've created lives for them and histories and backstories and we meet uh, each of the four founders, and then they meet one another uh, in Sussex in England, which is where William of Normandy landed his invasion fleet. And uh, war is appalling and terrible, and it makes for some pretty amazing story material. And so things happen around wars and battlefields that, that change people's lives. And as a writer, it's hard not to feel the pull uh, towards those points uh, when you want to tell stories. And so these these four meet uh, in Sussex and uh, various circumstances come together and they find themselves on a, a journey heading north um, toward what will eventually be Hogwarts. Uh, Hogwarts, the castle is, uh, the fictional place, is located in the highlands of Scotland. And so the, the four of them, uh, guided by several mysterious forces that become clearer as the story unfolds. They find themselves on, on a journey with a few other people headed north and along the way they encounter many strange creatures and, and people who are not quite what they seem and uh, magicians, magic people, magic folk living in quite a number of different ways and all of their experiences make them really reflect on, on what they want, what choices they want to make and what things they saw in their lives that led them to found the legendary school of Hogwarts. Wow. And you build this all from thought bubbles. Well, partly from someone else's thought bubbles too. So it, I took the basics of the world built from Rowling. And I also tried to maintain some of her light-hearted tone. And so in the first, not so much in the Deathly Hallows, but in the first six books, the, the plots are complex and sometimes the endings of the books are quite serious, very serious things happen, but she writes with a light touch and, and a sense of whimsical, fun, inventiveness. And so although this isn't a story about children, there are some, some kids in it. And, you know, the issues that, that the characters are thinking about are, are adult issues, but part of the fun and the challenge for me was um, I can be a bit intense and serious sometimes. And so this was a really good opportunity for me to to keep thinking about writing serious issues in a lighthearted, uh, more lighthearted style. And so that was that was a, a fun challenge for me. And, and uh, I, th I think I did fairly well with balancing, thinking about larger issues in the world and the magical world, uh, balancing that with, with a sense of fun, which is one of the best parts of the Harry Potter books. You just grab hold of some of those ideas and go with it. And you just go with it. So it's kind of a funny thing to do to write fan fiction because you don't sit down to think, I'm going to write a best-selling novel and make a million dollars because you can't make money off fan fiction for one thing. You can't sell it because the ideas are, are a copyright. So if you sit down to do it, you've got other motivations. And for me, it was... Uh, an interest in history. So as a writer, what I'm drawn to writing historical fiction anyway, which is what my first novel, Beltane, is. Uh, that's the genre, is this historical fiction. And being a, a really avid Harry Potter fan, whenever in the books, 
there would be a reference to wizard history, uh, my ears sort of perk up and I think, oh, what what was that about? Or, and, and knowing a bit about European history, I would think, oh, okay. So in, in their class, the history of magic, it said the ministry was founded in whatever, 1645, whatever it is. And, and I'd go, oh, well, what was happening in England in 1645? And I wonder what about that led magic people to decide that they needed their own organization and they needed to stay hidden. What What's the intersection there between events in the real world and events in this imaginary world? And so my imagination just kept throwing these ideas back and forth and back and forth and, and building ideas and then building characters and then building a story. And it's sort of started to tell itself in my mind. And Rowling's creative universe, she's such a great world builder as a writer. She creates this world with its own internal logic or lack of logic its own its own money its own history its own legends its own fairy tales its own some of its own language like its own words and i i really admire that in a writer and that's one of the things that overall as a writer i want to be able to do well is is to create uh, to create a world, invent a world that has coherence in in within itself. And so when Rowling did this, I, I was, you know, I really admired it, and I wanted to to write in that world and and historically as well. So those that's sort of where my motivation came from to to write this uh, to write the, the book. And you said um, in fan fiction, Rowling's okay with this. She is okay with it. Rowling has said that um, she's flattered if if someone wants to write in her in her universe. I think there's there's a lot of motivations for why people do it, and um, for some people it's um it's a way to start writing because some of the creative work has already been done uh, for you by the the writer who created the fictional universe, and then you can sort of enter that universe and wiggle around in there and create some stuff of your own. So I think she looks at it as a platform for beginning writers to to exercise, you know, learning how to write. And also, yeah, she has just said she's flattered that that people find her her creative work inspiring enough to want to work from. You mentioned she was helping beginning writers. However, this is not your first book. This is not your first rodeo. You wrote the book Beltane. Yes. Yes, that's right. So I, I hopefully I, I'm not quite a beginning writer. I think, um, my first self it was self published. Uh, it's called Beltane, and it's historical as well. So it's set in uh, 16th century Scotland, and uh, it's a bit of a coming of age story of a, a young woman who is bartered into an arranged marriage, and she finds herself in a bit of a swamp of politics and religion during the Reformation. Um, and it sounds like quite a different story, but a lot of the same questions. W- uh, got me started um, it, with with um, before the tide, my fan fiction, and with Beltane, and there are questions about being different, being marginalized. They're a bit a bit the same thing. Um, in Beltane, the main character is is a woman, and the the questions that I was curious about writing historically is what were women's lives like in a culture where women had so little freedom so few options in society had so many constraints had people basically the authorities like the church and and scholars saying flat out women are lesser women are weaker physically mentally intellectually spiritually psychologically and this was the 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 wisdom of the day this is what people actually taught and i was curious about how women lived in a world like that how did women have a sense of self uh, how did women have relationships uh, make choices how did women subvert those those things and so in beltane i explore those ideas and then in in the fan fiction in before the tide i got to have some 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 different kind of fun with those questions because if if a woman has magical abilities She's not constrained by the constraints that non-magic women have. And so in in the past, so in in Europe, say, which is sort of my my place in time, like medieval, early modern, it's a very violent place. Um, Force was all um, people fought each other, they killed each other. Uh, It was a violent, a violent society. And women are going to just suffer in a society like that because of physical you know, physical differences. And so if a woman has 
powers that allow her to just cast a spell from a distance. If she's a powerful magician, a powerful witch, she's got a huge advantage over non-magic women, and she's not vulnerable in the way that non-magical women are vulnerable. And so these questions about women's lives and how women survived physically and psychologically in in seriously patriarchal cultures are are sort of at the root of both of um both of my books and in in the fanfic I could I could really go wild and and um make make female characters who uh, who weren't vulnerable in the ways that that non-magic women were in history and that gave those characters a lot more latitude and a lot more freedom um, in the world and, and in their own minds as to to how they wanted to live. So I stretch this to other areas of diversity too, but that, and the story, the Before the Tide, the fan fiction, is not a story about women in, in the same sense that Beltane is. It's a much more of an adventure story and much more lighthearted, but those issues uh, were were common for me in, in both books. They're, it's issues, they're issues that I'm just interested in, and I like to, to look back at, at what women's lives were and how women survived in patriarchal culture. So those are those are that that particular issue is one that came up in in both books, but got treated you know quite differently because they're they're really different stories. So Christine, how did you come up with the title for the new book? It's called Before the Tide, and so um, the the it's got a bit of a double meaning. So the the tide of the Norman invasion was was so metaphorically speaking, the Norman invasion was was a tide that kind of overran the country and and um, washed away some things, built up other things. It did transform England uh, into something that different than it had, than it had been before. And the tide also sort of metaphorically refers to Hogwarts because Hogwarts becomes a magical center of education and scholarship and, and a school that, that endures for over a thousand years. It's in the magical universe. It's still there today. So really important place, a uh, really important idea that there can be a place um, for all magic people, but especially for children to go to learn how to be witches and wizards and, and to be safe. So the the tide refers to, to that as well, the tide of, of magic people pulling together and making a world where they can be safe from outside forces. So that one of the themes in, in Before the Tide is that magic isn't isn't quite as stylish as it once was. And so as the church became more powerful, uh, magic and the fear of magic grew. And the this isn't something I'm making up. This is just history. People who had magic were becoming more vulnerable, more persecute, more open to persecution. And so the um, the tide also refers to um, you know, the tide of public opinion turning against magic, the tide of, of magic people choosing to make a place for themselves, and the tide of the Norman invasion, which transformed uh, the world as, uh, you know, the, the world that they lived in, the country that they lived in as, as war and, and uh, invasion usually does. Christine, you're, you're talking about these universes, these worlds. How do you go about writing a book when you have all this whole, the, the entirety of everything people, norms, values, and all that. Where do you start? How do you juggle all that when you're writing your book? For me, it's all about questions. When I'm doing this myself, when I'm trying to world build, I start with the concepts that I want to be at the center of the world. And then I start asking questions such as, what are the rites of passage in that universe? So the so for us, there's you know baptism, graduation, marriage, having a child, dying, choosing a profession. All of those things are rites of passage. They're parts of points in our lives, sort of pivotal moments that are really important. So every culture has these, and they're sort of similar, but different cultures will do them differently. So one question in your universe would be, okay, what are the rites of passage? And then what professions do people have? How safe are people in the street? So you ask yourself a million questions and then you answer them. And as you world build in order to write something, not all of the things that you come up with may end up in your work, but you have to know them. You have to answer, you have to have answered those questions, at least in your own mind. And a big one for me, this is a real hallmark of an excellent uh, constructed world, is internal culture. So 
if you read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, there's a complete culture in there. They have songs, there's poems, there's legends, there's history, there's fairy tales. It's a completely internally consistent culture within within those books, within that created universe. So it's a process of the detailed and a process of the the huge concepts. And and it's so interesting. There's people who do this and they don't even necessarily do it to write. They just do it because they want to. It's quite amazing. I was on a, a list serve for a while um, for this very topic called con culture. And it's people who feel impelled to create construct cultures and some of them yeah they weren't they weren't they didn't have a goal of writing a novel they just their minds just spun around and made made universes it's it's quite interesting that pe- people feel impelled to do this it's quite yeah i was very interested to read other people's ideas about it so christine in mapping this out i know you don't use a map but how do you organize all your thoughts are you using your computer your files are you taking notes What's your process? So I'm writing as I go. I'm taking lots of notes. Um, with the fanfic, it was easy because uh, it's all been done uh, by rolling. So I was just able to just take that and run with it. But I'm working on something now, uh, which hopefully hopefully will become my next novel. And it's um, it's set about 8,000 years ago. And it's a time that archaeology knows some things about and we can guess some things, but mostly we don't know. So that's the great thing for a fiction writer is you can get in there and just yeah wander around and create your own stuff so i've got files on um names how do they choose their names they have a naming system i've got stuff on uh their creation myth i'm still working through the rites of passage what what things do they find what are taboo what's what's completely forbidden in in their culture and so um i've i've yeah i'm keeping notes i've got a whole file folder full of um you know, historical research, and then um, the plot stuff, and then just the straight, the straight up world building. What does their society look like? So I'm definitely taking notes as I go, and I keep adding to them. Um, I'm not completely immersed in the pro in that in that project yet. So I, I keep, I, oh yeah, I want to jot that down. So I, you know, open the file, add some stuff, and then when I'm ready to sit down with it all, it it will hopefully shape itself into something coherent. But I, I'm definitely uh, definitely writing stuff down because yeah, internal consistency, as you say, is is key to to making a convincing a convincing world. <laughs> I'm thinking of multi personalities, but uh, Christine, how many how many universes can you juggle at one time? <laughs> I I don't know that. Um one book at a time, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, I would say I would say one book at a time. And this is kind of new for me. So this universe, this world building, universe building is is I'm still I feel like an amateur still. So uh, Beltane I could draw from history and a bit of imagination. Uh before the tide I was pulling from from Rowling's work in creating a world and I it's, I made additions to that. I I one of the things Rowling does that I love is her books are full of book titles. So Harry or Hermione are wandering around the library and they're looking at book titles on the shelves and they're super creative, really witty stuff. And they, they're one of the things that make the books so fun, the books so fun for me. And so in Before the Tide that I've taken her idea of that and made up a bunch of books of my own and, and quite a few uh, songs uh, that are specific to the Wizarding World songs about magicians and witches and things that that are quite funny. So, but but the essential world building there was done by Rowling. So my next project is is um, much more ambitious because I can't I can draw a little bit from history, but mostly it's got to come from my imagination to make a coherent, convincing, compelling, w- constructed world. So that that's a pretty ambitious and it. It's a different process from the writing. It's really different. And I think I've, I've written four or five chapters, but I feel quite stuck. And I think that's probably the reason is that my world building process is is incomplete. And it's it's a sticky one because I'm not how do you know when your world building process is complete that I don't know. So I bet there's people who juggle several universes, but I, I feel challenged by by creating one. So I'm, I'm going to focus on that. Yeah. Will this be available in audio? 
Yes. So on my website, uh, there will be options for downloading a text file, or you can download the audiobook in a zip file. So it's uh, it will be available in MP3 format, and uh, it's about it runs about fourteen hours long. So uh, I I did the audio production myself, which is a little risky because I um you know people say your authors shouldn't necessarily read their own work, but uh, I I wanted the challenge of of uh, especially as a blind person reading in a in a on a good pace and with smooth good well shaped senses is is uh, is a challenge. And then I also wanted to experiment with. Uh, learning accents which is a whole other whole other kettle of fish so i dove into that a little bit so some of my characters are are from foreign places and and i've i've experimented a little bit with uh making making accents and making character voices and and i've obviously i'm blind so i've i've listened to tons of audiobooks and definitely i know what i like and what i don't like uh, so i tackled that because having an audiobook produced by a professional is very expensive prohibitively expensive so i, I took it on myself and uh, making that available on the website as well now you mentioned music and i was skimming through your website and looking at some audio versions and one of them started out with a song i believe you're playing the guitar on that too uh, oh was it odo the hero yes odo the hero they bore him back home to the place that he'd known as a lad they laid him to rest with his head inside out and his wand snapped into which was sad well, thanks for bringing that up that was so much fun it's it's actually so the song odo the hero first shows up in harry potter and the half-blood prince and hagrid and slughorn two characters they're having a drunken evening together and they sing some they sing something called the ballad of odo the hero and rolling gives us a few lines of it just the chorus and i was trying to find the central there was a central piece missing from the plot of before the tide and i'm i'm really interested in music um I, I like music a lot. I, I play it and I listen to it. And this idea of Odo the hero kept kept running through my mind and I couldn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And the story, so you never know what the story of Odo the hero is, why he's a hero. Uh, and so this story built itself in my mind. And when I was stuck in the book, in the plot, my, I started making up this song. It's well, it started out as rhyming verse, so it's the story of Odo the hero told in rhyming verse. And Odo the hero, they bore him back home to the place it's that he'd known becomes the center of how the four founders meet and why they end up going on a journey, a quest together, is is because of something that Odo did, and the story of what Odo did is told in rhyming verse in this song that I that I invented. So I wrote the rhyming verse, the the lyrics, and then I put it to music, and then I recorded it, and it's up on my website. Uh, so it's called the Ballad of Odo the Hero, and it's it is essentially the kernel of of Before the Tide of the fan fiction novel. And and thanks for bringing it up. Actually, it was very interesting and fun to do, and I'm I'm quite I'm pretty pleased with with how it came out. Well, I was looking up at your website and I was thinking about author, 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 and then all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh wait, she writes songs, she sings songs, she's quite an accomplished musician, and you've done songs with wind chimes. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really refreshing to all of a sudden just all of a sudden it just opened up another layer. I mean, I mean, just going through the website reminded me of all the stuff that I remember you talking about uh, tennis, blind tennis, the, the sailboating. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just it was like taking a little journey, a timeline through that. And I was going, oh, yeah, your audio. That's another big part of you. Yeah, I like doing audio pieces. And so there's a few on my website. There's a few um 
kind of documentary style-ish kind of pieces about uh, certain aspects of blindness or uh, there's some fun binaural recordings of just walking through the neighborhood. Um, the, I live in Toronto, Canada, which is a, a big city, and you get it gives you lots of choices of things to do. I feel quite lucky. Um, the the crowds and the noise, you know, it's, it's it's a trade-off, but it means I get to do things like belong to a blind sailing club. or a blind tennis uh, organization or a goal ball. Hearing is several games going on at the same time. Oh, I did, yeah. Yeah, it would have been a really fast one. Okay. So I would have tried to say back up, hard yeah. right. And yeah, you'd oh, okay. Back, you'd back up yeah. diagonally to the right. Okay. Ready. And so there's lots of opportunities around, and uh, I, I loved I loved creating audio out of out of some of that fun stuff and and uh yeah throwing it up on the website and just uh just let people check it out yeah i really enjoyed your trips that you took it almost felt like i was right there there's a, a series on my website of i think it's eight blog posts about uh, an incredible trip that my partner and i took with with two friends we uh we flew to Rome, and then we took a transatlantic cruise back, which came back to Florida. So we were on a ship across the Atlantic, and I did. It started out as po blog posts that I wrote, but at the same time, I was recording audio uh, in various places as we went. And when I got home, I took the blog pieces, recorded them as audio, and then edited the soundscapes that I had recorded uh, in various places in, in Italy and, and Spain and Portugal and, and on the ship and made um, made compositions that were they end up being a bit journalistic because there's sort of the 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 verbal piece of, of me giving my impressions of what we were doing and then there's genuine audio from from the places where we were and it really gave me a sense of why people take pictures because because as a blind person I'm like yeah ho hum another picture try to smile um just you know and i think yeah just live in the moment put down the camera but but then i think you know as time goes by our memories get dim and and i can share these recordings with my friends and with my partner you know now or 10 years from now and it'll be just immersed back in the experience in a way that your memory just doesn't do for you and so creating those made me more more empathetic and more tolerant of people who want to take pictures because I suddenly sort of got I'm like oh yeah it's because it triggers your memory in a way that your memory alone uh, can't do and that's one of the, the the good parts for me about making sort of um audio that isn't just reading it's it's lots of sounds uh, done in different ways or, or composed deliberately and and then you've got this this audio tapestry that's a real thing that that triggers memories yeah in a way that I guess photographs do for for sighted people mm -hmm. I remember one of them distinctly comes to mind and I, I really enjoyed it you were on a ship and the captain actually gave you a mini tour but mm. you had all the sounds you know everything was there and it was just it was awesome it's like you're right. The binaural mics are the best, right? Because you're so immersed. You're completely. Uh, it's it's it is like you were there. I, there's a great one. Uh, I enjoyed this one. Uh, it was not on that ship, but it was on a, a one of the sailing boats from the Blind Sailing Club in Toronto, and I took the binaural mics up with me to to just uh, lie on the bow, like there's space up at the bow, and and uh, so I was just lying there, just chilling you know, wave sounds and sea gull lake gulls and oh, it's beautiful. And then um, uh, the the people in the cockpit yelled up, okay, we're tacking, which means that the sail is going to move over from one side of the boat to the other. So I'm like, okay, cool, stay low. So I stayed down. And in the recording, what you get is the sail going Mm. moving from left to right and this completely when you listen to it you kind of want to duck because you think oh my gosh it's odd the audio effect is is spectacular uh it's it's like it's going right over your head and yeah binaural mics are just just endless amounts of fun yeah picture has a thousand words but audio canvas wow 
<laughs> yeah, a pitcher won't make a duck, right? <laughs> Honestly, like I listen to it, I know it's coming, and I still hear the moving, and I, I sort of lower my head because I think something is actually moving over my head. So it's a more uh, more immersive experience, and it's part of the reason why uh, my um, before the tide, I've I've done an audio version of that. Uh, I recorded it myself, which is a, it's a big risk because a lot of people say most authors should never read their own audio books, and and so I, I did it with some trepidation. But um, part of the reason is. Uh, for for my my blind friends or blind people who who enjoy audio more than e text, which definitely includes me, I'm not a big e text reader, but um, also for just any any reader who wants a more immersive experience, because you can read text off a tablet or off your computer, or you can have a somewhat richer experience by by listening to it. And I'm, I'm interested in in the the sort of increased popularity of audiobooks among sighted people it, it's it's great for blind people because it means tons more titles are available and more quickly um, and, and I'm interested for I don't know what it means but it, it seems to mean something to me that that sighted people are interested in that as well can you tell the people what your website name is yes I will say it and then spell it so it's beltanethebook.com so that's the title of my first book so it's b e l t a n e thebook.com and so there's um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on there uh, and the prominently displayed there will be the the fan fiction called Before the Tide um, and as well as um, links to purchase uh, Beltane which is my my first historical fiction novel and there's sections with the uh, songs and stories and music and uh, there's uh, odd, you know sort of audio documentaries and it's uh, it's pretty busy there's there's lots of stuff going on there it's very accessible oh thank you i my partner de- uh designed it and he's blind so definitely accessibility was uh, was at the top of our our list of, of things we wanted there so when can people expect to see before the tide uh all the pieces are in place um it's going to be posted any day that probably this week that's exciting it, thank you. I've, I've, I'm quite excited about it. Um, I've been, I've been publishing it in serial form as I go, posting chapter by chapter, and it's so excellent to do that because there's people who are patient enough to read it in that way, and so there's there's already um, some people who have said really flattering things about it and and are excited for the the new. So what's coming now is sort of a re-edit, and and I've re-recorded the audio with a bit, uh, ramped up the quality a bit. So it's 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 exciting for me and it's extra exciting because other people are excited for me because they've been reading along and and, uh, seem to be enjoying it as well so for sure by the 1st of June uh, it will be available probably uh, yeah probably sooner well I had a chance to read your summary and it really got me intrigued into the fantasy I don't know where I left fantasy behind in did you uh, used to read it uh, I remember Dune. I remember those snake things coming out of the desert. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, Buck Roger. I mean, that type of stuff. But <laughs> yeah, I was I was there at one time. I was all about that. Wizards, um, uh-huh. a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, you just don't know where. You, maybe it was kids. Maybe it was. Thing. I don't know what it was. That I ain't find the that real world. That's <laughs> not the real. You had enough to deal with with kids, right? That, uh, yeah. <laughs> I got them the book, though. I got them the Harry Potter stuff. Yeah, anything to get kids reading is is definitely a a good thing. I read this great. This is totally tangential, but I read this great. I think it was Rowling who retweeted someone who said, "Never make fun of someone for mispronouncing a word because it means that they first encountered it while reading." And I was just like, "Yes, yes, that's brilliant." Yeah, and you just, I just keep thinking about that. I read that months ago, and, and not that I would ever make fun of someone for mispronouncing a word, but it's it's so true. I think about it now. Anytime I hear someone mispronounce a word, I think, oh, you obviously know what the word means, but you haven't said it right. So, yeah, you you read, and, or, and that's great. Or they're great. visually impaired, and they're speaking how your screen reader reads it. <laughs> that's true, too. <laughs> That's true too. Quinoa. We have lots of food words around the house that uh, that Jaws just mangles into incomprehensibility. So we have quesadillas and, and quinoa quinoa casseroles, oh, yeah. <laughs> ravioli. 
stuff like that. You, you gotta love it. You gotta take it in stride. You know, you want it. All, you want all the accessibility and all that, but yep. you'll take a Quinfella once in a while. I'll take it. <laughs> there you go. Well, Christine, thank you very much for coming on and talking about your book. Your, oh, thank the new you. release, all your other books, your the processes that you go through to create these worlds and universes it's like wow that's just it's fascinating well thank you I, i've enjoyed the conversation I, I love talking about writing well thank you very much Odo, the hero they bore him back home to the place that he known as a lad so fun talking to Christy Malik, as you can tell from her writing, her blogs, her audio, that her passion for what she does just rubs off on you. You almost enter her universe when you're around her. So go check out her website, BeltaneTheBook.com. That's B-E-L-T-A-N-E, TheBook.com. Check out her audio, check out her blog, check out her reading, and be sure to check out her just-released fan fiction book before the tide once again thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed and until next time bye bye odo he found himself in the south the why he wasn't quite sure when we share what we see through each other's eyes we can then begin, begin, begin to bridge, bridge the gap between the limited, limited expectations, expectations and the reality, and the reality of, of blind abilities of realities of blind abilities. Of blind abilities for more podcasts with a blindness perspective check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com on twitter at blind abilities download our app from the app store blind abilities that's two words or send us an email at info at blind abilities.com thanks for listening One of the striking things about being on the ocean for me is, well, two things. Technology makes the world seem quite small, but uh, to us puny little people, the world's actually really big. And when you're on the ocean, you get much more of a sense of that than, than at any other, in any other experience that I've had.